and thank you very much for joining us this rainy Wednesday afternoon as we provide the latest information on COVID-19 and its impact here in Orange County with remarks and updates today in this press event are Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings, Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer, Dr. Raul Pino, Health Officer for the Florida Department of Health in Orange County, and the Chief Officer for Orange, Chief Communications Officer for Orange County Public Schools, Scott Howitt. We'll begin with our comments from Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings. Mayor. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Williamson. Thank you to all of you for being here this afternoon. As I begin uh, my comments for this press briefing, I want to remind you that the focus this week on our efforts here as we fight the pandemic in this community is uh, on three things. Number one, I said that we'll be focused on stopping the spread of the virus in our community. Uh, number two, increasing the number of uh, testing sites here within Orange County. And number three, to begin the planning process for the recovery or the reopening of businesses here within Orange County itself. And so with that, uh, you're going to hear some themes throughout uh, what all of us will say today to kind of come back and uh, refocus on those three points. According to the Department of Health, Orange County now has 1,051 cases with 18 deaths within the county itself. You're going to hear more from the Department of Health, uh, Dr. Raul Pina, about what uh, those numbers really mean to us. So far, over 12,756 tests have been administered. By next week, that number is expected to increase significantly. Uh, on uh, Monday, April the 20th, uh, the, uh, the five state-run uh, mobile, or I should say temporary, testing sites will be open for business in Orange County. You can see them on the heat maps that we have displayed here. Uh, they are marked by a blue dot. These uh, testing sites are exclu exclusively for Orange County residents, and they are free. Uh, they are by appointment only, and the plan calls for only one site to be open each day. There will be over 20 call takers uh, assigned to handle the scheduling, and they can field up to 1,000 calls a day. Uh, Dr. Pino will come back and fill in the details in just a moment about how these uh, mobile or temporary testing sites will operate. In addition to the state testing sites marked with the blue dot, all of the other testing sites can also be found on the map. Four of the five temporary sites are located in Orange County run parks. Uh, they are Blanchard Park, South Econ Park, Barnett Park, and West Orange Park. The parks will be closed while the testing is ongoing. Now, uh, health care workers at the uh, Orange County Convention Center are now able to do 750 tests a day, which is up from the 400 tests they had been previously doing under the administration of the Florida Department of Emergency Management and FEMA. Uh, this drive-by site is free and does not require an appointment. The incident commander at the Orange County Convention Center site, uh, again, a state-managed uh, and operated site, asked that I remind the public that that site is a regional site. It's not just for Orange County residents. Anyone within the region uh, who uh, meets the criteria are able to go to that particular site. I want to switch gears a bit now and talk about personal protective equipment. Uh, through private vendors, Orange County is supporting over 250 different organizations with masks, gowns, face shields, booties, hand sanitizer, and other supplies. Those groups include first responders, assisted living centers here within the county, and health care workers. Much of what we have ordered from private vendors has come in piecemeal because of the overwhelming demand. Then there uh, are the requests that we are submitting to the state of Fort Florida. Let me give you an idea about the demand for supplies and how these demands are being met. As far as the state is concerned, we are slowly getting our PPE requests completed. Ninety percent of the face shields we have ordered of 40,000 have been received and distributed. Forty-five percent of the N95 face masks we have ordered or 118,000 have been received and distributed. Only 17% though of the 
Protective gowns of 14,000 have come in and have been given to those on the front lines. Uh, we have an abundant supply of shoe covers and hair covers for, from the state, but we still need significant other supplies. Providing uh, resources to our homeless community in Orange County has been an ongoing concern, and I want to take a moment to shed light on what's uh, been going on behind the scenes. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we have been working with our different uh, homeless uh, services providers, and some 200 N95 masks have been provided to them. Uh, some 12,000 surgical masks have been provided. Uh, 2,500 travel-sized bottles of hand sanitizer has been provided, and we are providing that to organizations that support the homeless in our community. Organizations such as Matthews Hope, uh, the Coalition for the Homeless, Catholic Charities, the Salvation Army, the Orlando Union Rescue Mission, and others. There has been um, coordination across all providers, including homeless, the Homeless Services Network uh, and Emergency Management here within Orange County, to uh, work with the Florida Department of Health, the VA, and local hospitals to expedite resources uh, being provided to some of our most vulnerable residents. On Friday, April the 10th, uh, the Orange County Isolation and Recovery Center, sometimes referred to as the IRC, opened with two residents. Uh, these are residents who have tested positive for the virus and need temporary housing in order to isolate themselves. As of the beginning of this week, no shelter has reported a resident who has tested positive or who has been symptomatic. Those in individuals who are resting and recovering at the center site are freeing up hospital beds for persons exhibiting symptoms that are more intensive. There are still current needs for thermometers, linens, towels, blankets, bed clothes, hospital gowns, robes, and much more if you uh, have the desire to uh, make a contribution in that regard. In addition, if you have cleaning supplies, Ziploc bags of food and beverages you like to donate, please take them uh, to the collection site at the Center for the United Against Poverty. Again, that's the Center for United Against Poverty. We want to thank United Against Poverty for continuing to serve as a clearinghouse for individuals or companies wishing to make donations for our region's homeless population. I would like to uh, reassure our community that we are working hard behind the scenes to come up with a framework to allow businesses to reopen to get employees back to work. Again, that has to be a very measured process. We are still not out of the woods when it comes to this forced shutdown. We will have to achieve widespread consensus from our health care leaders that the virus is not a threat in the community before we reopen business. Again, uh, I want to uh, focus on uh, the reopening of businesses and this coming Friday. We will share much more details with you about that planned uh, reopening process. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mayor Dyer for additional comments. Thank you, Mayor Demings. As we look at the data and start to see the curve flatten, I know that's because everybody has been doing everything they can to make this happen and to stop the spread of the virus. Our actions are determining our destiny here in Orlando, and right now we've changed that curve and we're changing it every day. So our data-driven measures are working. And as Mayor Deming said, we continue to work on ways to expand our testing. Earlier today, the Department of Health announced they are opening multiple mobile sites across Orange County, as Mayor Demings detailed. We're pleased to be a partner in that effort and will be utilizing Camping World Stadium to support this additional testing model. The location will provide free testing located near downtown in our west side neighborhoods in the city where residents can walk or bike or drive or take alternative means of transportation. And that site will be open on Wednesday the 22nd. Anybody over 18 can take advantage of that, but you do need an appointment. Change from some of the mobile, other mobile sites where you had to drive in a car, you can walk in, you can bike in, but you still need to have an appointment. Call the health department for that. Brace Orlando. We know that many of our businesses are still seeking assistance and they've had a difficult time 
navigating some of the processes either at the state level or the federal level. And that's why we're partnering with the Orlando Economic Partnership to launch a new free service program to help our small businesses navigate the various assistance programs. The new service is called BRACE, which stands for Business Recovery Assistance and Collaborative Engagement, and will ensure that our businesses get connected to the right resources that their businesses with their unique needs need as soon as possible to help them and their employees. The way to work, you'll fill out a form to let the Orlando Economic Partnership know about your business and what your needs are, and you'll be provided with an ambassador to steer you through the programs and help you figure out what forms and how you can seek that assistance. So we want to thank the Economic Partnership for continuing to help us with this fight in the pandemic and help us with our economic rebound. Finally, as most of us continue to stay home, we're grateful to those who can't stay home because they're providing essential services, medical professionals, first responders, City of Orlando, Orange County staff, grocery store employees, teachers, bus drivers, helpers on the front line. And we should all be proud of how we've supported one another from a distance through our not-for-profit organizations and other individuals that are making donations of face coverings and other essential items. And we've rallied behind those businesses and their employees. And we today are launching a new program, a movement, I guess, called Thank You Orlando. It's a Thank You Orlando movement. So what we want you to do is use hashtag Thank You ORL on social media to keep that recognition going. We want you to thank the people that are out there helping you every single day. So it's pretty easy. Hashtag Thank You ORL. Together, we can continue to strengthen our resiliency to help us weather this storm. And at the same time, once again, we need not to become complacent. Orlando, keep it up. Keep staying smart. Keep staying safe. Keep staying home. Dr. Pino. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank our mayors, uh, the city and the county government for all the support uh, to the health department. Uh, the mayor went over the numbers I will announce on the mobile testing site, and then after that I will announce on the people who have been recently added uh, to the list of uh, uh, disease, unfortunately. Um, our mobile testing site uh, will begin uh, next Monday. Calls uh, will be starting to be taken at the call center uh, tomorrow. A number is the same, 407-723-5004. Uh, we will be doing between 250 and 300 tests a, a day, which uh, will depend on the level of supplies that we get from the state. Uh, but so far, we think that we'll be okay for the first week uh, to, do e uh, to do each of the sites. And then we'll reconvene and reevaluate and may do it again, another round, depending on how the epidemic it's going. Um, the objective of doing the, this testing at, at the, um, the mayors, uh, both mayors, if I ask uh, for us to get into the community and be able to test those areas that are um, most affected by the pandemic or where we have the higher number of cases. And we did everything possible to get the closest we can to the center of, of, of those areas. But uh, in some cases, we we're not able to get exactly in the middle of the storm right there, but it's because of the space that we need to be able to do these type of events. Uh, mindful that um, we have to move uh, to uh, mobile clinics and we have to move trailers with all the equipment, the cones, the printers, the computers, and everything that comes with this. So it's not a very simple uh, operation. It's, it's complicated. But we are ready and we will do on Monday. Uh, there is no cost associated with uh, this testing. The state will assume the cost and we are testing individuals 18 and older. We are not testing younger than 18 because of parental consent that will be needed and we need to speed the process. So we are not checking IDs, we are not checking identities. We are taking names, no phone numbers during our uh, reservation and we will do that. Um, the activities will be done as long as we have the test kits. 
And we think that we probably will be ending by 3 o'clock every day. We hope that weather helps. Uh, we know that is um, rain announced uh, for next week, uh, but we will be there rain or shine. So the, the testing sites is intended for each of the areas uh, that we are going to be the closest to so that people can walk, bike, or take the bus if they need to, and also we'll be taking vehicles. The, the sites will be on Monday, April the 20th. We'll be, do, we'll be doing Jay Blanchard Park. On Tuesday, we'll be doing South Econ. On Wednesday, we'll be doing Camping World. On Thursday, the 23rd, we'll be doing Barnett Park. And on Friday, the 24th, we'll be doing West Orange Park. With regard to the people who have recently been added um, to the list of disease in our community from the pandemic, and our thoughts and prayer are with the families, and we can only imagine what they are going through. Um, these cases um, have been uh, happened since last weekend, but and sometimes we have to wait for confirmation of the test. That's why we are reporting today. So the first one is a 80-year-old white male with significant uh, health conditions, pre existing conditions, and this person uh, died on the 11th. We have a 60-year-old black uh, non-Hispanic uh, male who um, we don't know exposure, nor we knew in the first case, and um, with uh, significant uh, pre-existing health condition, this person um, died on the 10th. We have a 71-year-old Asian, non-Hispanic male, uh, with exposure associated with travel outside the county, uh, also with underlying conditions, and that person died on the 10th as well. We have a 60-year-old black, non-Hispanic male, that was exposed to a known, a positive person, and um, we don't know if the person had pre-existing condition yet. That person died on the 12th. And then we have an 85-year-old Hispanic female with known exposure, with uh, significant health conditions, who died also on the 12th. With that, after um, this, I will be answering any questions that you may have, and I'm about to introduce uh, Scott from the school health system. Thank you, Dr. Pino, and our, our thoughts and prayers are also with those families. Thank you, mayors, for your leadership as well. On behalf of Dr. Uh, Jenkins, Superintendent Jenkins, and the school board of Orange County, we continue to focus on our top two priorities during this ongoing crisis, educating our children, and providing meals to every student in need. Distance learning continues for our 212,000 students here in Orange County. We've seen a lot of activity. Um, our weekly logins on our learning platform has exceeded 1.4 million. Posted assignments, almost 2 million. While our middle and high school students have district issued devices, we are continuing to expand devices um, and access to devices for our third, fourth, and fifth graders at our Title I schools who do not have devices at home. Last week, our team distributed 1,173 devices, and this is an ongoing effort that will continue. We want to thank our teachers, our parents, our principals, our administrators, and our technical support staff for their hard work to ensure our students continue to learn through distance learning. Last Friday, we began providing meals, uh, weekend meals for all children. And all children, um, children did not have to be present under the new federal waiver in order to receive those meals. Parents, guardians, siblings could just provide names of students and they would receive the meal. Last Friday, we actually distributed 185,000 meals um, that's four times the daily average. We serve 62,000 students. That's three times the daily average. So in one, one Friday with those two changes, we saw significant increase. We are in our fourth week of meal, uh, meal program, of the meal program, and we will exceed one million meals served this week. On Monday, 
uh, we began our meal distributions for students who are experiencing homelessness. On, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, meals will be distributed at, at designated temporary housing locations around the county. In an effort to help safeguard our community and conserve resources, beginning next week on April 20th, we will be moving to a three-day per week meal distribution schedule on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It'll match the homeless um, uh, student schedule at our 52 sites. Meals for Tuesday and Thursday will be given on Monday and Wednesday, and weekend meals will be provided on Fridays. They will get six meals on Friday. For now, there are no meal distributions um, on the weekend. And just a reminder, our meals are for those students in need and uh, those that have families that are struggling. We want to ensure that there are enough meals for all of our children that really need them. Thank you to our food service staff and, and our hourly employees who are working hard uh, to make sure our students are provided nutritious meals every day of the week. In an effort to keep more individuals at home, we are also announcing that we'll be making adjustments in the district office hours in an attempt to limit exposure of our employees and families. Beginning next week, April 20th, all school sites and district offices will be closed on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but work will continue remotely. We have already begun uh, making arrangements and have made arrangements for a vast majority of our employees to work from home. A special thank you to our employees that are working remotely, keeping our community safe and the district running. And just a reminder, even though school sites are closed and, um, and uh, district offices are closed, our campuses are secured 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we have security cameras, voice monitoring, sound monitoring, and regular surveillance. As far as return to school and graduations, the governor and commissioner indicated last week it was too early to make a decision on the return to school timeline. Uh, the school board last night had a conversation around that, what it would look like, and, um, and moving forward. And we'll continue to wait for an announcement by the governor and the commissioner who was going to follow up on the return to school date, which was originally May 4th. We're thinking sometime this week we will hear uh, something from uh, the commissioner of education. Last week, Superintendent Jenkins met with her student advisory council, and high school principals have been meeting with their student government leaders virtually. We let our seniors and their parents know that graduations at all high schools have been postponed, not canceled. We are working on alternative plans for smaller venues, uh, school auditoriums, or football stadiums, if um, the crisis uh, would allow at some point, or even exploring the option of doing virtual graduations. Our hearts certainly go out to our seniors, our class of 2020, during this uncertain time. We've seen their disappointment and witnessed their resilience during an extremely difficult and unprecedented time, a pre precedented time for them, something they were not clearly anticipating or looking forward to. We continue to remain hopeful for future graduation ceremonies and celebrations. And in closing, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Our OCPS mental health services team has a help line available for parents and students. It's available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. They will be working remote as well. The number is 407-317-3694. Uh, there's also information on ocps.net. You can click on the health advisory link on the front page. They also have set up a helpline for OCPS employees, and that can also be accessed through the employee intranet site. And of course, you can always call 211 at any time someone is experiencing a crisis or emergency. So please visit our website at ocps.net for more information. Uh, you can also follow Orange County Public Schools on Twitter and Facebook for the most current updates. We appreciate the opportunity to give an update and thank you for your time and we hope everyone stays safe. Thank you.
Okay, uh, hopefully the update has been informative at this point. We are opening up for questions, and I remind uh, those of you who may ask questions, uh, if you're asking a question of someone at, at the mic, uh, we'll try to have that person answer all of the questions that are uh, being asked of that individual at the time. If you want to ask questions in other languages, uh, in particular Spanish, please feel free to do so. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Pino will uh, respond to those questions, and we're working very diligently to try to make certain that we translate uh, the uh, press events and put that up online in multiple languages as well. So with that, any questions? Yeah, right here. Hi, Eric Sandoval with News 6 and ClickOrlando.com. I don't know if this is for you, Mayor Demings, or for Dr. Pino, maybe both of you, but I would like to talk about something Dr. Pino touched on, and that is the location of these mobile test sites that roll out on Monday, specifically the zip code 32822. We did a story last week. A pastor was uh, worried about some of the people who were in that hot zone who did not have access to a vehicle to drive the six miles to this test site. Can you speak to getting a test site maybe closer to this hard hit area? I, what I would tell you is that um, we will have some flexibility. We are trying to establish uh, what we will refer to as strike teams that will have the ability uh, to be mobile, to go into specific areas if a person does not have transportation to be able to get to a particular site. We're really limited somewhat uh, in where we set up sites uh, because of just the geography that we need to be able to set it up. One, number two, we're limited by the availability of the collection kits themselves. And so there is, has not been a, an overabundance, if you will, of uh, collection kits that's available in our community. So uh, with a finite set of uh, resources that are available, uh, we remain optimistic every day that we will get additional uh, collection kits into our community. Uh, we are, however, working with the private sector partners who have uh, announced other uh, locations within our county, and uh, I believe that we will see additional testing sites become available through the private partners, the, the hospitals, et cetera. For example, you know, there was a site set up uh, today that opened up at the Millennium Mall. Regarding the 32822, uh, we're trying to work through the provisions that uh, the Department of Health is putting in place there. But again, look forward to, if we receive additional uh, resources in the community to be able to test, we will use these strike teams, if you will, to be able to go to individuals uh, who may have a need. So even if they make that known now, if you have a need and you're not able to get to one of those sites, uh, you can call a number and uh, we will try to accommodate those individuals. Dr. Pino. No, I think that you touch on all my points. So part of the issue is that we have to have and I know it's sometimes difficult to understand these pieces, but whatever we go with the type of equipment and the type of testing, there are also liability issues. And I know this may not be the time in the middle of the crisis to talk about that, but the reality is that it was easier and faster to get county sites like the park than getting into private locations that we may have to establish a contract, establish a liability, a Walmart parking lot, or Costco, or a church parking lot. Part of the issue is also that if, if we were doing walk-ins, it would be a lot easier, but when you are doing cars, then it complicates matter because it takes a lot of space. Part of doing cars is also we want to protect our workforce. From the car, they are less exposed to the possibility of acquiring a virus than face-to-face -face with the individual. And we need to have a way to get in and out in a different way so that we don't establish a loop to help the traffic. And these parks have that. They have an entrance and an exit in a different direction that we can move the traffic to. But as the mayor said, if needed and if we have the resources, we will continue to increase testing and we will get to the block level if we have to. One more question for Orange County Public Schools, if you don't mind. Uh, yesterday, the Florida Education Association sent a letter to Governor DeSantis. I know you touched on this just a little bit, but they were urging DeSantis to extend the school year virtually and close the schools for the rest of the year. Do you, does the district have any comment on that or any stance? 
Uh, that actually the school board spoke about that last night, what it would look like in a return, and certainly uh, we're hopeful that that will be revisited. We know that the governor had originally said and the commissioner that it would be revisited before May 1, and so we're looking forward to that. The board did discuss uh, possibly sending a letter to um, to the governor, um, you know, just uh, stating their position. I think that's still in the process of being worked through. So um, I think they'll they'll have something shortly. Thanks. Hi, Alexa Lorenzo with Channel Nine. Um, there's been a lot of concern that our Spanish-speaking neighbors aren't getting the information directly from you guys because of that language barrier. Do you guys think you've been successful in addressing specifically our Spanish-speaking community? Uh, absolutely. 100% absolutely, because we have commissioners saying that they do feel that there is a fear we, that they're not getting that, that dialogue. You know, in, in, in our case here within Orange County, we have uh, three uh, Spanish-speaking commissioners who I believe work tirelessly to make sure that their respective constituents get information. Uh, we post the information. We translate these uh, press events. Uh, we have, I have staff members who are working full-time. Uh, to ensure that through the various uh, Hispanic organizations that uh, throughout the day that they uh, communicated with. So uh, the short answer I gave you is yes. I do believe that uh, even at these press conferences we endeavor to, if you have a question in Spanish, certainly you can ask that question and get a response. So many of the uh, personalities who you see in leadership roles, they are bilingual. Uh, you see uh, Dr. Pino here, but uh, Dr. Yolanda Martinez is the Director of Health Services for Orange County. You've seen her speak here at these press events as well, so I think, yes. Okay, other questions? Buenas tardes, Félix Pirela de Telemundo. Dr. Pino, eh, específicamente el Código 32822, eh, su mayoría de comunidades hispanas, no vemos que haya uno de estos cinco puntos específicamente en ese código, el por qué. Y también queremos saber cómo harían las personas de bajos recursos que quizás no tengan vehículo para poder ingresar a esas pruebas. Y una segunda pregunta, hemos visto acá, según las eh, estadísticas que ustedes tienen, que en los últimos dos días han disminuido los casos de contagio. ¿Usted cree que está bajando la curva o esperan, según estos nuevos modelos, como todo eso cambia todos los días, cuándo serían los días más críticos acá en el condado? So, the question in Spanish was... Uh, to um, why are we not locating one of the testing sites at uh, the zip code 2238, uh, no, 32822, and why um, what that was not the case. La respuesta en español para esa pregunta es que eh, tratamos de acercarnos lo más posible a los lugares. Uh, Recuerda que un heat map. Uh, no quiere decir que el centro de, del problema está en el área que está ahí más roja. Uh, porque lo que está diciendo es que esa es la concentración de casos en ese zip code. Y hace un círculo el, 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 el programa, hace un círculo alrededor de las áreas y te va dando la intensidad por color. Pero nosotros también tenemos la información de exactamente dónde está cada persona que ha sido diagnosticada en el condado. La razón por la que seleccionamos esos sitios es porque son propiedades del condado o de la ciudad y no habría uh, problemas con legales y de establecer contratos, lo cual demora días en poderlo hacer. Y también que los parques tuvieran una entrada y una salida de manera que podamos mover el tráfico. En el caso de ese uh, lugar, es el único que no está situado en una ruta de guaguas. Y tu otra pregunta fue, ¿qué vamos a hacer con las personas que no tienen transportación? Y entonces, nos estamos acercando lo más que podemos. Uh, no vamos a poder estar al lado de cada persona que necesita una prueba. Eh, eso es prácticamente imposible. Pero sí vamos a estar lo más cercano que podamos. Y es mucho más cercano que el sitio que nosotros tenemos en Alafea, es más cercano que el sitio que tenemos en el Convention Center, es más cercano que el sitio que está en Milenia. Por lo tanto, nos estamos acercando lo más que podemos. Uh, the answer uh, in English to those questions, the first one has already on to why those uh, sites were selected. The other part of the question was 
um, what will be the case uh, for people who may not be able to use transportation to get to the sites. And I was mentioning that it will be impossible for us to get next to every single person in the county, but we are trying to get as close as we can. And, and with the limitations of the physical space and what can be done in each of the spaces. But I also was saying that those places that we have selected are closer than the convention center, are closer than Alafeya, and are closer than Millennia, or are closer than any of the hospitals. So we are getting closer than any previous testing site. And it's not a reason not to think that we will start getting even closer if we have the resources ahead of us. No, las personas pueden caminar o ir en bicicleta. Y en el caso del 222, eh, estamos pensando, hay alguna manera de organizar un, una ruta de guagua que coja por una avenida principal. Estamos viendo esa posibilidad, pero no lo puedo anunciar porque no lo hemos concreta, concretado. Lo único requerimiento es que todo el mundo tiene que tener una cita. Para llamar a la cita hay que llamar al 407-723-5004. Y le estamos pidiendo a la gente que no lleguen 15 minutos antes de la cita. Part of the issue that we are trying, why we are doing it by appointment only, is that we want to stagger the flow of individuals. Because it's in the middle of communities, so we don't want to have a line of three hours of cars waiting, and then someone getting there, and we saying, hey, you wait three hours, we don't have a test for you. So we want to avoid that part too. So that's why we are doing uh, appointments. I was trying to avoid that question. Uh, are the cases coming down? So the short answer is yes. The long answer, I don't want to be the one who called the curve and then we get a second spike. Um, so we are cautiously optimistic that our curve is looking very well, and we already had a pick. Was that the pick? That's the part that we don't know. Um, uh, Sone location had had uh, multiple uh, picks. It has been correlated to lack of um, commitment to continue with these measures that are in, steps that are in place to protect the people. If anything else, we should intensify what we're doing to finally get to the finish line on this. And the, the mayors have spoken about that before. Estamos en vivo para Telemundo en español, eso mismo que me acaba de decir. Sí, el asunto es que me estaban preguntando la curva, ¿y dónde está la curva si los números de casos han disminuido? Y la respuesta correcta es sí, los números de casos han disminuido. Ha disminuido también el porcentaje de casos positivos. Ha disminuido también el número de personas que están hospitalizadas, ha disminuido también el número de personas que están en el ER, ha disminuido también el, el número de ventiladores que están en uso y el número de camas que estamos usando en intensive care units. Todo eso nos hace pensar de que estamos um, recibiendo los resultados de las medidas que se tomaron hace dos o tres semanas. When a mayor make those decisions two or three weeks ago, we always said the results will be seen in two weeks. And this is what we are seeing now, the results of those steps that were taken two or three weeks ago. That's why we should not, we should not relax our measures too early because we will see a spike two or three weeks from now. Gracias. For now. Okay, and let me just also um, kind of go back and respond to why the certain sites have been chosen. Remember that these sites that we're talking about, these are state-sponsored, state-assisted sites, we still remain short of adequate supplies of testing or collection kits in this community. So Orange County has 53 zip codes, and uh, probably 50 or so of those zip codes now have at least one case in it. In order to manage the limited supplies of resources that we have, Today, it is impractical for us to set up a testing site in every one of those zip codes because we don't have the resources and at least the kits to be able to do so. So we have to manage that by moving that throughout the county, 
to extend the reach of our ability to offer tests to everyone. Every demographic in this county uh, is important to us in that process. We're not leaving out any demographic. Uh, and certainly, as you heard me say, one of the things that we've endeavored to do is to get closer and to the various communities, east and west and uh, central to uh, our county. And if a person really has a need to be tested, mm, they can call and we can make some special provisions if that person really doesn't have uh, the transportation to be able to do so. Do so. Even with our uh, bus uh, system, uh, you know, it's rear entry now uh, and it's free. So if uh, you can somehow make your way, if you're able-bodied enough to uh, a bus stop and to be able to get to one of these, it uh, creates an option for you. But uh, again, we have this arduous task of having to work in an environment where we simply do not have adequate testing kits. Uh, we have had to rely on the state for that. And uh, daily, I have a phone conference call with uh, state representatives uh, who are on that call, um, primarily from the Department of Health, uh, our hospitals, and others in this community where we all mutually have this interest to increase the testing. So uh, I get promised each day, you know, in terms of the supplies will flow into the community and we remain optimistic, but they still have not come in at the level that. I truly believe that we need. Okay. So, other questions that we might have? I have two questions. Lara Greenberg, Fox 35. This is for OCPS. Um, if the that? governor announces that the school year will remain as distance learning for the rest of the school year, uh, what additional steps does OCPS still need to take? I know you mentioned you're already looking to expand some access to devices. What else needs to happen? Well, we want to continue with that process. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at, we have survey data that we did four weeks ago before we launched into the distance learning endeavor. We, um, we're looking at that data, who has devices, who has access to uh, internet, to Wi-Fi, and then providing those resources to those in need and doing it very systematically, making sure that we're taking care of the students in our Title I schools, uh, third, fourth, fifth graders, um, as I said before, our high school and middle schoolers have devices. They are one-to-one. -one. We're going to continue to make sure that we are um, repairing any of those devices if they become damaged, making sure that we're continuing to pr provide more content, more resources for our teachers, uh, for our parents, for our students, um, updating those, uh, those resources uh, daily and weekly. Um, and then this is another question. This is for Mayor Demings or Mayor Dyer. I know that there was a GOA board meeting earlier today as well um, where there was a recommendation made to do some deferments of uh, payments uh, with certain vendors and whatnot at the airport. Can you explain a little bit about what exactly that means and what that looks like for the airport? Well, uh, let me start by saying that in terms of our, our international airport, um, it is much like every other major uh, international airport in, in America and around the world. Uh, it's um, air passenger travel, the number of flights has dipped here at our airport by 97.2% uh, compared year to date uh, to what it was last year. As a result of that, uh, the revenues um, to the airport have declined significantly. Uh, a number of the businesses, because of, of the, the governor's order, et cetera, uh, have not been able to operate. And many of those concessionaires at the airport uh, want to uh, abate. That means not have the airport charge them rent uh, for several months. The airport is a publicly owned and operated airport that is absolutely vital to the overall supply chain, food chain, et cetera, uh, for this en entire region uh, and perhaps to the state of Florida. It had been operating at um, rec a record pace of over 50 million air passenger travelers through the airport 
in a, in a 12 month period of time. Today, that has plummeted significantly each day, probably a couple of thousand or so who are going in and out of the airport. So with that, the uh, board for the airport has the obligation, the fiduciary responsibility to ensure the fiscal health of the airport uh, going forward and try to plan to keep that vital part of our infrastructure up and running. And so today the board uh, passed uh, three resolutions that will essentially defer the requirement for concessionaires to make their rent payments, their lease payments, et cetera, until July 1. Didn't say that uh, we were abating it because I think it requires the airport to constantly review the impact that any funds provided through the CARES Act to concessionaires, small businesses, large businesses to the airport, uh, we have to understand um, the realistic uh, potential to get revenues from those federal sources and how that will impact our airport. We have a great uncertainty about uh, the future air passenger travel. How soon will that return to uh, some uh, economically feasible level? Uh, so a lot of questions and uncertainty. So the board uh, took action today to at least uh, be sensitive to the concessionaires and say we're not going to require you to make those payments now uh, that contractually you are obligated uh, to make. We're simply deferring them to the future. Some of the concessionaires desire that the decision would be made now to abate, forgive the payment and we're just not in a position I think to be able uh, to do that. Uh, so that is uh, what I will offer to you. Um, we have to look at to the future uh, for the return of our um, significant air, uh, activity at the airport. So Mayor Dyer, uh, uh, he, Mayor Dyer says he's, he's going <laughs> to punt on that one and so hopefully I, I answered your question. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dave Reporter, 32805. So, you know, one of the things that observers have said is that the one, if there's one good thing that came out of COVID-19, it's kind of exposed the kind of structural racism because of the areas that have suffered most profoundly across the country have been African-American communities. So people are very anxious talking about when are things going to get back to normal. In many of these communities, normal wasn't a good thing before. So I guess my concern, my, my question both to you and Mayor Dyer is, what is your vision of what, are we going to go back to the old normal or will we come to a new normal? Because again, we've exposed these chronic diseases and poverty where people can't survive without a check and stuff like that. What are the things so that these communities will not be an afterthought or get left behind as we try to recover from this you know, global catastrophe? I'm going to share the podium with Mayor Dyer. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask him to respond as well. David, I, I think right now we are focused on the three things that Mayor Deming started the meeting out or the press conference with, and that's flattening the curve, number one, so that we make it through quicker, getting testing at the various sites and getting as many people tested as we possibly can, and then figuring out how we're going to economically recover from that. There are so many questions um, as to what the new normal is actually going to look like. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't even have a crystal ball to tell you when we're going to come on the downside of that other slope. Maybe we have peaked already. Maybe we haven't. But I don't think anybody can envision what the new normal actually is going to look like in even two months from now. The only thing that I will add is, uh, David, we're, we're certainly sensitive to it. The pandemic uh, has certainly um, increased the sensitivities to the underserved in our nation. Uh, I think, at least I speak for myself, when I come to work every day, what I try to do is ensure that we level that playing field for, for all people. And I'm going to continue to do that. I know that uh, Mayor Dyer is committed to that as well. We have said here within Orange County government that we are committed to that. 
uh, regardless of what happens uh, at the federal level or the state level, when new policies are written uh, regarding you know, uh, the treatment of the underserved, et cetera, health care uh, disparities, uh, all of it gets implemented at the local level. And so because we're here where, in many cases, where the rubber meets the road, uh, I believe that we have the kind of sensitivity to the plight of all people in this community. For the Board of County Commission here in Orange County, uh, this board is perhaps uh, as, as diverse as it's ever been. And I get to work with uh, six women who are, who are mothers, who are just caring souls uh, as well. They're very diverse in terms of the constituencies they uh, represent. So all of us are laser focused on trying to deal with the myriad of issues that we have regarding uh, inequities, inequality, racism uh, in, in America and perhaps in our own community. Okay. Uh, there's a question over here. <laughs> okay. This question comes from Ryan Lynch with the Orlando Business Journal and is geared towards you, Mayor Dummings. Um, in regards to the Economic Restart Group, what kind of businesses are you targeting for the Economic Restart Working Group you mentioned? Have you reached out to the county to take part or have their voice heard? What does that look like? Okay, what that group will look like, uh, it will be representative of the broad array of businesses that we have here in our community. From large to small to those that have been impacted, uh, so we want representation. That uh, group of individuals, it may be 40 or 45 people or so that could will represent those from small businesses like hair salons or barber shops to r realtors to uh, theme parks to uh, professional services to financial services uh, and uh, we will work with chambers uh, to have the kind of diversity that we believe that we need um, we're pretty fortunate to have a, a global corporation here within our community, and I, I, I won't name all the individuals who uh, we are communicating with, but for example, Disney. Disney, because it has a global footprint, uh, and it has dealt with, uh, for example, um, the, the Asian um, crisis and uh, overseas, and um, in terms of where they are with uh, their experience with the pandemic, they are probably ahead of us. And so with uh, Disney, uh, Tokyo, and other places, they've experienced uh, some things with, uh, in terms of the planning process that I believe can be beneficial and instructive to us as we began to respond to the very uniqueness of our county. That response has to be somewhat more regional uh, we had a wonderful conference call today with uh, the counties of Orange, Osceola, Seminole, and Lake Counties because of how our workforce, uh, and where they live, where they work. Uh, so this conversation has to be broader than just uh, within the confines of Orange County itself where we will uh, have uh, some representation uh, on our uh, task force, if you will, the Economic Recovery Task Force uh, from the surrounding counties. But because each county does have its own uniqueness, uh, I uh, expect that each one of the counties will also try to understand its own uniqueness, again, from the local perspective to make sure that uh, we're working uh, in the environment with the federal government, the state to ensure we do the best that we can do to get our businesses back open. What that uh, reopening will look like is going to be different uh, depending upon the type of business that we're talking about. But with their input, uh, we hope to uh, be able to capture that and come up with uh, some recommendations as we uh, shape public policy here within, within Orange County and the local community. Okay. 
Hi there, Justin Soto with Channel 13. I'm not sure who this question would go to, but we're seeing that 3M filed a lawsuit against an Orlando-based company, Geftico LLC, accusing them of posing as 3M and trying to sell their products at inflated prices. Do you guys know anything about that investigation, anything locally done there, and any reaction to that? I, you know, obviously whenever you talk about um, a criminal investigation where a fraud may be uh, at play, uh, active criminal investigations we're not going to be able to talk about publicly, you know, those investigations. So I'll just leave it there uh, that uh, if individuals suspect that they are being victimized because of fraud or what have you, uh, make that report to your local authorities and they'll work it out whether or not uh, that gets uh, upgraded to state or federal investigatory uh, processes. For the new testing sites that are opening next week, I understand there's no symptom requirement for these testing sites. Are you recommending everyone get tested or who are you recommending come to these testing sites? Anyone who would like to be tested. <clears throat> The testing sites will not have any consideration for symptoms um, because we wanted to open it up. Uh, some of the concerns from the community is that our testing site, Alafaya, is very restric restrictive, and that's because the lab that we are using requires that type of restrictions. And this one, we will use one of the private corporations, and the state will put up, you know, put up uh, with the bill. But it's a lot of, um, and people don't get to see this part of the work that's been done. It's a lot of um, emergency running in the background of um, any press conference because two minutes before I came here, I was told that the test kits that we have in storage could not be used for the drive-through because of the lab that we are going to use. So I, I really thought that I will have to tell you that that was not going to happen. But we made a few phone calls and, and got a reassurance that we would get the test kits that we need to complete the entire week. And so it's a lot of work happening in the background and the testing sites and the criteria is part of that work and it's based on the fact that we want to amplify what we are doing and that footprint. Uh, that could bring some negative numbers because as we go into the county and explore people who normally may not engage with the healthcare system, we may find new cases. I'm pretty sure we will find new cases. How many, what the percentage is, and that type of data, uh, we will only know when we do it. Mayor, you could be brief on this. Um, we see you <laughs> every other day. The community sees you every other day up here. Some days more serious than others. Can you just kind of give us a gauge on how you're feeling about how we're doing right now compared to how we were doing and how you feel like the future of the community looks right now? I can tell you that each day as we progress with this pandemic, I feel better about it. I feel better about our ability to understand it. I feel better about our ability to respond to it. I feel better about the uh, prospects of uh, recovering sooner than later. Okay, thank you all very much for being here this afternoon. Uh, again, we'll look to Friday for another update. We return you to our regularly scheduled programming already in progress. Orange County is on the front lines of